car, and we're now the owners of a, of a, of a Chevy Volt, which we very much enjoy. So Pat, who is um, in the red there, is, uh, is someone who started teaching in 1973, and she never stopped. She started out as a high school teacher, uh, teaching physics, science, and math. She started her own business and then helped to start the Waterloo um, Iowa Science Imaginarium, and she was the first science instructor there. She taught at the University of Northern Iowa in the physics department. She did educational outreach for the UNI museums and then settled into the job of energy coordinator at UNI's Center for Energy and Environmental Education, and she's done that since 2001. She, she brought a bunch of uh, teaching props there that you'll be interested in. Um, based on the needs of K through 12 teachers, Pat developed the fabulous resources for energy education, the free program which offers materials to borrow or buy, and STEM-based uh, professional development opportunities. She was part of the Iowa Power Fund Board and Due Diligence Committee. She served on the boards of the U.S. Green Building Council and Iowa Renewable Energy Association and is a current member of the Office of Consumer Affairs Advisory Panel and the Iowa Wind Energy Association Board. She's a very busy woman. <laughs> she, on a personal note, she lives in a home that is powered by the solar panels on her roof and will soon uh, begin receiving energy credits from her shares in the Cedar Falls Simple Solar Park, which is really a neat thing. Solar powers not only her home, but her Chevy Volt as well. Her work to create a safe and abundant future is personally motivated by her two children and her two grandsons. She works to improve the present with her beautiful, bountiful yard and garden. And Mark Frank, our other presenter, is a writer, educator, and advocate for that which helps people. He's educated as an engineer, and he has a lifelong interest in science, the environment, and our society. He has driven on electricity since 2013 with power from solar panels on his property in Ely, Iowa. And I know there's a lot more but I'll, that I could say about him, but I'll just turn it over so they can use their time to teach us about electric cars. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, that's pretty much it. Are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wrote the, uh, on the first slide here, I wrote the part that showed up in your uh, brochure, I think, or your website. So you'd know what you were getting into here. I'm talking about using green electricity and electric cars. And uh, our idea is you can save the planet and your budget at the same time. So, let's start here. So I want to start with this summary. So when you use an electric vehicle, for the planet side of the equation here, you have no emissions or pollution at all if you use solar panels to feed that electric car, which both Pat and I do. If you don't use solar panels, it's low emissions. And uh, if you use, we know that Iowa's wind is about 30% of the electricity generated in Iowa comes from wind energy. We're the highest of any state in the United States, highest percentage. Uh, with an electric car, there's no pipeline or tanker spills. No Gulf Coast drilling disasters. <laughs> no refinery explosions. <coughs> no military to keep foreign oil flowing. And less landfill oil filters, mufflers, etc. Electric cars don't have those things. They don't have mufflers. They don't have oil. <laughs> now, for your budget, you can buy a used. Um, oh, I skipped Canada Forest tonight. So, yes, no Canada Forest. Uh, sacrifice for tar sands oil. The United States gets between 15 and 20 percent of its gasoline from Canadian tar sands. And tar sands are pretty bad. And I'll show a picture of that here shortly. On the budget side, I'm sure everybody here is pretty budget conscious. I know I am. I'm retired now. Um, you can buy a used electric car for between $10,000 and $16,000. Uh, because electric cars have such low range, they're mostly for local errands and commuting and that sort of thing, they're going to have low miles when you buy them. You'll see later, I have a table of what you can buy and how many miles. I looked it up yesterday. So low miles and wear. If you have solar, you have a locked-in price 
for your fuel, so to speak, and eventually it's free because the solar panels will pay themselves off in about eight years, I figure. Uh, gasoline dollars are very volatile. I have a chart that shows how volatile gasoline dollars have been. I think people who, anybody who's ever owned a gasoline car knows that just before Memorial Day weekend or Labor Day weekend, mysteriously, the gas prices seem to float upwards. Um, whereas electricity is regulated. Uh, grid electricity costs about a dollar a gallon. So as long as gasoline costs more than a dollar, it's cheaper for me to drive my electric car. And if it's $2, it's that much cheaper, $3, $4, and so on. It saves about 2.5 cents per mile compared to a car that gets 38 miles per gallon and if gas is $2. So how many people have cars that get better than 38 miles per gallon? Yay. Okay, hooray, that's great. <laughs> so the rest of you, um, at, at 38 miles per gallon, you can save 2.5 cents per mile. Um, there's almost no maintenance on a pure electric car. Basically, when I bought mine, the dealership sits down with you, they go through the manual, and they say your first uh, service comes at 6,000 miles, and here's what you do. Uh, we check your suspension, and we rotate the tires. And the uh, next service interval is 12,000 miles. We check your suspension, and you rotate the tires. And you third, turn the third page, and I said, well, let me guess. At 18,000 miles, you check the suspension and you rotate the tires. Is that right? <laughs> and the whole book was like that. So there's really not much to do. There's no oil. There's no oil to change. Uh, the Leaf battery does eventually lose some of its capacity. So Nissan has a 100,000 mile warranty and for eight years on their Leaf battery. The price for eventually replacing it is $5,500. So after 100,000 miles or eight years. All right, that's the summary slide. Now let's talk about saving the planet. So on the left, I picked four pictures that represent when we use gasoline and oil. And by the way, I have two cars. My other car is a gasoline car, so I'm still using a little gasoline and a little bit of oil. Uh, where we get our energy for our cars is a choice that matters. So you might remember there was a big Santa Barbara pipeline spill recently. That's what that picture is. Right next to it is a refinery explosion that happens to be in Texas. Uh, this is the Gulf oil drilling platform explosion. This was the New Horizons Gulf Coast disaster that we had uh, early in the Obama administration. And then the last one is Canadian tar sands. So these little objects here in this picture are trucks. These are big trucks. These trucks are two and three stories high. They're the largest wheeled vehicles on the planet. And tar sands, to, to imagine what it's like, it's like you took a laundry tub and filled it full of playground sand, and you took a quart of motor oil, and you poured it into the sand, and you mixed it all up. You end up with this dark, gloppy mixture, and that's what tar sand oil is like. Dark, gloppy, and thick. And the way they get it out of the ground is by pit mining it. So, this is an example of a big tar sand pit mine. And the pit mines are so big you can see them from space. They're big, they're really big. And uh, the way they get the oil out of the sand, since they didn't make theirs up like my example, you basically took the, you take these big trucks, you dump the oily, gloppy sand into a big vat of water and you heat it. And you heat it and you heat it and you heat it, the water gets hot and the oil floats to the top and the sand goes to the bottom. And then they skim it off with big skimmers that rotate through this big vat and skim off the water. When they're done with the water, I don't know how much they can process before they have fresh water in, but when they're done with the water, they really can't release it. It's full of toxicity from cooking out the oil and the tar sands. So they just have big holding ponds. And the holding ponds are so big, they can be seen from space. And they're so toxic that they have air cannons around the edges of these big holding ponds to make exploding noises to keep the birds from landing on it because birds that land on it die. That's how toxic the holding ponds are. So I'm still using a little gasoline. I'm not completely divorced from this situation. But most of my driving is on my electric vehicle. And I have my own refinery. And there's a picture of the backside of it right there. It's on the south side of my property. 
I have 15 panels, and we have a prairie reconstruction, it's about an acre. We always have a family or two of bluebirds. This is one of those bluebirds from that family. And it's sitting right on top of my refinery. So when you think about saving the planet by switching to electric vehicles, the mental image I want you to have is this bluebird somehow perched in this picture, or in this situation, or maybe in this situation, <coughs> or in this situation, and then come back to where there it is perched on my solar refinery. So how much did it cost me? <clears throat> well, for the number of panels I used to feed my car in a year's time, it cost me $4,200 for this bank of solar panels. And for that, I get 25 years of fuel for my 4,200 bucks. Nice, clean energy from the sun. It takes 93, the sun, our, our own personal little fusion reactor is 93 million miles away. It takes eight minutes and 20 seconds for that sunshine to get here from the sun. And then it strikes my solar panels. Uh, it gets converted to electricity, goes up a wire into my house, goes into the battery of my car, charges the car up, and then I want to drive it around, drive it on sunshine. So, pretty simple, pretty easy, pretty clean, pretty safe. Oil, on the other hand, takes 60 million years to make oil. So a question I get asked a lot is, well, um, but if you drive an electric car on grid electricity, aren't you just shifting the emissions from gasoline to like a coal-fired fire power plant? It's a good question to ask. So the Union of Concerned Scientists did a really nice detailed study of this. It's a 43-page document. Is the summary of the study. And they looked at various parts of the country and broke them into regions based on the grid mix in the various regions. So California is one area, Texas, Florida. And then they figured out what kind of mileage would your car have to get to equal the carbon emissions of an electric car being fed off of this grid in one of these regions. So the Iowa region is 43 mile per gallon. So if you live in this region, if your car gets better than 43 mile per gallon, then you're getting a lower carbon footprint than an electric vehicle except for the fact that the Iowa numbers were based on 2009 numbers, at which time Iowa win was 14%, and it's 30% now, and we're headed to 40. So when you adjust for that increase in win, then the Iowa 2014 number is 55 mile per gallon. So if your car gets better than 55 mile per gallon, then you can have as good a, a carbon footprint as an electric car running off our grid here in Iowa. By the way, you can ask any question anytime. Questions are good. So, anybody got any doubts about that? Electric cars, lower carbon footprint? Okay. We're lucky in Iowa. We have the highest percentage in any state of wind energy. What about uh, saving the planet and war for oil? Um, do we ever do military interventions to keep oil flowing? <laughs> in Alan Greenspan's book in 2007, he states in print, the Iraq war is largely about oil. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office estimated of the 2.4 trillion long-term price tag for the war, about 1.9 trillion of that would be spent on Iraq, or about $6,300 per U.S. citizen. Uh, one of our former CIA directors, Jim Wolsey, says that people used to fight wars over salt until we invented refrigeration at which point salt became kind of moot as a strategic commodity. And his opinion is we must make oil a non-strategic commodity. No more wars for oil. So that's one of the reasons I had my electric car. It's not just about climate change. It's also about fewer wars. Okay, so we've talked about saving the planet. Now we can talk about saving your budget. Use EVs. So EVs like the Leaf and the Volt are coming off three-year leases. They both start selling around 2011. And people put them on three-year leases. And when those leases are up, they turn them back into the dealerships. So there's a whole body of used 
the electric vehicles coming on the market. There was a federal rebate, $7,500, that's already been applied, so that means the used cost is even lower than you might expect. The LEAF is a local driving only because of its EV range and recharge time, so I drive my LEAF for all my errands I run between Cedar Rapids and Iowa City, but I really can't drive my LEAF to California or to Ohio or Michigan or Florida. It's a local driver only. So I can go round trip from my house up by Cedar Rapids, come down to Iowa City, shop, go to a nice restaurant, visit my granddaughter, and then drive up, back up to Cedar Rapids all in one charge. That's the kind of range you get with an electric car. Because of that, those used Leafs have very low miles and wear. There's almost no maintenance with an electric car. It makes the perfect second car. It's cheap to buy, cheap to operate, and very cheap to maintain. The Volt, which Pat drives, is an extended range electric car with a gasoline backup generator. So for people who are concerned, gee, I, I would like to drive this car a long way. So I could go to Chicago and I could be able to drive it to Ohio or to California. Chevy Volt is your electric car. It has a gas, up, a gas backup generator built right into it. But on average, uh, Chevy says that Volt drivers typically drive 75% of the time on electricity. So that gas backup generator is only running about 25% of the miles. So when you buy a used Volt, you're buying a gas engine that has only 25% of the wear of what a normal gasoline car would have. So you're getting a very low wear vehicle when you buy a used Volt. <coughs> On top of all the maintenance things we've talked about, gas is very volatile. Electricity cost is regulated. And this next slide, shows how that goes. Down here you have the equivalent electricity to a gallon of gasoline. And you can see it's pretty flat over time. This is from 1976 to 2012. And here you see the 80 recession, Iran and Iraq war starts, uh, 81-82 re recession, crude oil <laughs> price collapse, you might remember that. In that, Iraq invades Kuwait, there was a spike there, Asian financial crisis, U.S. invades Iraq, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Rita, Hurricane Ike and Gustav, Libyan crisis. So if you've lived through this, which I think most of you have, you know how gasoline has gone up and down and up and down over time. This chart just shows how much compared to almost a ruler flat price for electricity. Electricity is regulated by our state. They can't raise the price of electricity just for Memorial Day weekend. So, in different parts of the country, is the price of electricity differ? It does. The average price across the United States is about 12 cents per kilowatt hour. That's what I pay in Cedar Rapids. I understand in Iowa City it's about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. So you're paying a little less than the average. I'm paying on the average. But in Hawaii. Uh, it's really expensive. You had a question? Uh, how long, let's see, you charge your car when the sun's out. Yeah. And how long does that take? Um, it depends how much I've used. So yeah. it's kind of like how long does it take to fill the gas tank? Well, if you just filled the tank 10 miles ago, it doesn't take very long to fill the tank when you've only driven 10 miles. So that's the way it is with my electric car. So my wife and I drive about 11 miles to Westdale Mall and come back. And we do a lot of shopping at Target and places like that. So that's 22 miles round trip. That takes about an hour to charge back up. So the total range for my car now that it's two and a half years old is about 80 miles. So if I used all 80 miles, it would take something like four hours to charge it back up. But whenever you're home, you've got it charging. Like right. Yeah. Yeah. For my Volt, I usually have it on overnight. And the neat thing is I'm at Cedar Falls Utilities and so I'm not paying too much. I'm paying less than 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and they're thinking of going to time of use um, charging. <coughs> and so if they start charging me for my night charging, um, that's okay. I'm making my electricity and I'm selling it to them during the day, you know, noon when they need it for those air conditioners. And then I'm buying it back at night. So it's a pretty good deal. Um, and generally for my Volt, I'm only using the gas um, 
engine, and it's not just your regular car engine. It's more like the gas generator that you would use if you um, had the electricity go out and you needed a backup generator. That's what's in my car, it's, it's something like that. And I would say I only use it maybe two days out of a month. If I have to drive to Des Moines or drive to Cedar Rapids, then I'm using gas. But most days, I'm just on electricity. We had another question back here. Yep, got a question in the back. Uh, normally for batteries, if you go down a half way and go back up, eventually they don't go more than half way. So these batteries, are they built differently so that you can just discharge halfway, they go all the way up and then they go all the way to the bottom? Right? Yep, the answer is yes. Uh, the ones that had that battery memory effect where you only used half and then charged it back up, pretty soon only could charge is half. Those were not nickel cadmium batteries. And so NICAD batteries were used quite a while. These are lithium ion and they have no memory effect. So typically if I drive to Westdale Mall and come back and I've used maybe a quarter of my range, I'll plug it in and just charge it right back up. But you, from that point you go all the way down to zero? Yeah. And back up again? Yeah. No memory effect. Yeah. Mark, is, uh, reminds me about uh, optimal uh, temperature on the, on the batteries. And some I've heard that in the winter, your range is only. I've heard that the range on the batteries is only about 50% when it's, say, below zero. What do you know? What can you tell us about that? That's absolutely correct. Uh, batteries are a chemical reaction. When you put electricity in, chemicals change. When you pull electricity out, chemicals change. And so if you've ever had high school chemistry and you saw Bunsen burners, you heated up things to make those reactions go more quickly. If you chill things down, like in the winter, at 20 below zero, the reactions don't work as well. So you lose about half your battery range in the winter. So in the summertime, I can drive to Iowa City very easily round trip on one battery charge. In the wintertime, like at 20 below, I can easily get here halfway, you know, one way. But then when I'm down here in the winter, it's 20 below, it's pretty cold, I'll arrange to have lunch uh, someplace where there's a charger, like the hy on North Dodge Street has a charger. They have a nice little market cafe. We'll just plan that as part of our day when we come down and we'll have lunch there. And that lunchtime, it charges up enough easily to get home on. So. For my Volt in the summer, I can usually go 40 miles. In the winter, it's around 20. And I was in Minnesota when it was 20 below with my Volt, and I'm happy to say it started right up. It wasn't with the batteries, but that little gas generator worked fine. Yeah, yeah just, I just wanted to say on the, on the battery question, so I drive a Volt as well. Um, the Volt manual actually recommends that you, you plug it in as soon as you pull into the garage and keep it charged and keep it warm so that it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to warm itself up on those winter days or something right. like that. Um, and I, I see here in Iowa City, I go from anywhere from 40 to 43 in the summer to you know somewhere in the mid-20s to around 30 in, in the winter here in Iowa City. I get on, on my battery, so, yep. yeah. As we go to more and more battery cars, do you foresee that there may not be as many charging locations as needed? Um, I used to think that, you know, when I bought my electric car, I didn't have any experience owning an electric car. So I thought, wow, you know, will there be places to charge up? And I don't know. I've never done this before. So I was pretty worried about that. But the bottom line turned out to be that in the summer, it's just not an issue. I mean, you know what your range is. I can come from Cedar Rapids to Iowa City, drive around different stores, shop, visit my granddaughter, drive home and still have energy left over. So it's not, just not an issue, as long as it's a local drive. It does become an issue in the winter time and you just have to plan it. So I've got a chart that shows the chargers here in Iowa City. It's, it's a pretty good situation. There's a lot of chargers here. Let's see where that's coming up. Um, this talks about how much you can save. It's about uh, two and a half cents a mile. So for 10,000 miles a year, it's 250 bucks at $2 gas. If it was $3 gas, it'd be 500 bucks. If it was $4 gas, it'd be 750 bucks a year for fuel savings. Um, here's the map of the different chargers. So Coralville at their UIHC parking deck 
has eight chargers. And they're not used much today because there aren't a lot of electric cars around. But when I come to Iowa City, I'm often pulling in there. You know, I might have breakfast at the Perkins out there by UHC. I might go to 30 Hop for lunch or one of the breweries or one of the other restaurants in that area. And then while we're having breakfast or lunch, we'll be charging up the car. And I would say when I go there out of those eight chargers, there might be two of them that are busy. So right now, that's a good spot to go. When they built their intermodal transportation center, they added six more chargers in that same space. So there's a lot of chargers there. Uh, Northeast Iowa City, there's ACT has three. The High V and North Dodge has uh, two different locations in the parking lot, so they can do a total of four. Uh, south side of Iowa City, the Van Meter, the Nissan dealer, and the Chevy dealer each have chargers. And there's a new High V coming to North Liberty, and I, I don't know how many they'll have, but it is the High V policy that when they build a brand new store from the ground up, they build chargers in there. So I'm assuming it'll be four, like the North Dodge. Yeah. Is there a fee then for charging your car? There's not. Uh, it's completely free. Which sounds kind of wrong, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I go someplace and have lunch, and I get free fuel for my electric car. It makes me feel like, hey, if we come down here in our Mini Cooper, well, where's the free gasoline? Because I think that's <laughs> deal. And the reason it's free is that we have a monopoly on selling electricity in the state of Iowa. Only utilities are allowed to sell electricity. So these places like Hy-Vee that put them in so that people will come to the store or have lunch at the store, or Coralville so they'll go to that area and they'll have lunch at that River Bend Center there. Um, they're doing it to attract people and they're just footing the bill for the electricity. It doesn't cost much for the electricity that I charge. It might be 50 cents or a dollar. So it isn't very expensive, but right now it's all free. Until the until the until they stop being monopoly, I guess it'll stay free. <laughs> I just wonder if there's something larger coming in the market instead of these yeah. things that like a pregnant water skate and you get run over by a truck in your bed. <laughs> you need to see my my Chevy Bolt. My my Chevy Bolt's on a um, uh, what chassis was it? Corvette. Yeah, I'm on a Corvette chassis. Oh, well, 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 <laughs> I have an electric bed. <laughs> Yeah, my Nissan Leaf is on a Nissan Versa a chassis. So if you've ever seen a Versa, it's about the same size. No, that's only this big. No, room for two people, realistically. Well, I will offer to let you sit in mine out of the parking lot. I'm parked right next door here. It seats five adults comfortably. So I'll, I'll let you come on and sit. In fact, I'll give you a ride if you want. Yeah, you can see. it's. Uh, I'm six foot one. I'm not a light, thin guy. And I can sit in the back seat very comfortably. Uh, with the seat all the way back. So it's got plenty of room in it. Yeah. Would you address the problem of lithium supply in the world as well as disposal of the batteries? Sure. To reach their lifespan? Yep, so lithium supply. They use lithium ion batteries. Probably going to be a lot of lithium, right? Um, one of the world's largest supply of lithium is in Chile. It's, in, it's dissolved in a salt briny lake. And the way they get the lithium out is they extract it from the water. And so that's one of the biggest supplies. They also have big supplies in Nevada. And you may have heard that Tesla is building a big, gigantic, what they call a gigafactory. And I just read today that they've completed that factory. And part of the reason they chose Nevada is Nevada has supplies of lithium. <coughs> and so um, everything I've read, there's plenty of lithium to make the batteries that we want. Now, what happens when they, uh, the charge begins to degrade? So my car started out at an 84 mile range. It's sitting at like 80 now. It'll continue, I've had it two and a half years. So let's say it drops to 68 miles. And I feel like, wow, 68 is just not enough. I need a new battery. There's still a lot of energy storage potential in that battery. And what Nissan <coughs> is experimenting with is taking new <coughs> batteries, plugging them into racks, and then using them as solar and wind backup storage devices. So that's what they'll do. They won't recycle them right off. They'll use them until it falls even lower in terms of the charge cycle. But eventually, I'm sure they'll recycle it because lithium, that's a good commodity. It's worth recycling. So, yeah, question back here. Oh, 
acceleration a problem? Is Power? You know, I haven't gotten too many tickets, although the only car I've owned that I've gotten a ticket is my electric car. So, I got a $180 ticket for speaking in my electric car. Well, if you come up a ramp onto the interstate, can you pick up you well enough? You can. It's one of the best things about an electric car. Um, electric cars use electric motors. Electric motors have a very nice property. Um, the thing that pulls you up a freeway ramp isn't really the horsepower in your engine, it's the torque. The torque is a measurement of leverage that your engine is providing. And you know if you have a big long lever, you can move something pretty heavy, right? I mean, that's Archimedes said, if you give me a place to stand and a long enough lever, I can move the earth. Well, torque is a measure of that leverage. And electric cars are very torque rich, and all of the torque that it can produce is produced and available at the very first RPM that it does. Whereas on a gasoline car, you know, you have to ramp the speed up with your RPM until you start getting appreciable horsepower and torque out of it. On an electric car, as soon as you hit the accelerator, we'll call it gas, as soon as you hit the accelerator, you've got all that torque available right now. And it's just the, the nature of electric motors. So it accelerates very nicely. It's, it's much faster than my Mini Cooper that I have. Yeah I, I, yeah, I wanted to speak to both those questions because my family, we own both a Prius and, a, and I drive a Volt. Um, we have a 2005 Prius and I was concerned about you know, what happens with the battery. They're refurbishing Prius batteries now to the tune of I think you can get them for between $1,500 and $3,000. So there's, there's a, a market for these batteries to be refurbished. So that's one way that they don't, they don't uh, sort of go back into the environment. Yeah, and, and in fact, like, the Volt's probably the, the most fun car I've ever driven, compared to a Prius. I, if you think of a Prius dri like driving a go-kart, um, that's kind of what it feels like compared to driving the Volt, because, because the, the speed is just instantaneously there. There's no chemical reactions or firing of pistons that has to happen. So it's, it's a lot of fun. And for the, for the gentleman who wants the bigger vehicle, Tesla makes their crossover now. Um, and it, it has gull wing doors, and it, it's really, really nice. It's only about $150,000, so. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. You were talking about going over the owner's manual that at 5,000 miles, you checked the shocks and rotated the tires. What about, I mean, when wheels turn, they usually involve bearings. They what do. about lubricating? They do. So, um, I trained as an engineer, and I worked for General Motors for 17 years. Um, most vehicles you buy today, gas or electric, use permanently sealed bearings on those cars. And it used to be, a long time ago, you had to get under there with a grease gun and up those bearings but it's not that way anymore they're they're they will last the life of the car so. okay so when I go into uh, with my uh, combustion engine and tell him that I want to change the oil he always puts down LOB or whatever it is lube oil and, and filter. filter LOF yeah and, uh, so really I'm not really getting a lube or am I getting moved? Yeah, you're, you're getting an oil change. That's what you're getting. Okay. And a new filter. And maybe an air filter. Okay. But you're not getting a chassis loop. Yeah. No, not anymore. Yeah. Are these popular enough um, that you have a waiting list? Or are they able to keep up with the demand right now? Um, now I think it's an excellent time to buy an electric car because gas prices are down. So the interest in buying electric is lower than it would be if gas was four dollars a gallon. So I'm sure if you go to Carousel Nissan and buy a new one, they'd probably be very happy to sell you one because interest is lower since gasoline is so cheap right at the moment. Um, for the used cars, which is really what I'm talking about here in today's presentation for your budget, um, I, don't, I assume they're just. They are what they are. People are trying to sell them, and whatever the interest is in those cars, that's what they can charge for the prices. Yeah. 
Yeah. Follow up question. As a matter of information, I was at Nissan yesterday. No, uh -huh. is this Tuesday? Well, whatever, Saturday. <laughs> and uh, you know, looking at the leaf, and and he said that uh, that uh, you know they don't have any, but you know they uh, like they frequently can get them at an auction. I probably in Chicago. I don't know that are uh, executive type things or whatever for around ten thousand mm, dollars. That's a good so price. He, so he'd be happy to sell me one for mm, one to you know eleven to twelve thousand probably, and they might be pretty nice. Yeah. And so that was news from Saturday, I think. So I went on Auto Trader yesterday. I mean, he's ever used Auto Trader to look up used cars. Yeah, you can look up like a whole region. So I put in a 200 mile radius. I found 100 used Leafs. Uh, here's the ones I found. There was a 2011 for 8,400, uh, 2012 for 9,000, and a 2013 for 9,400, and 2014 much newer for 16,000. They're all in Chicago. But the question is, when you buy a used leaf, which has local range only, how do you get it home? <laughs> so you tow them or haul them. So this is a picture of a leaf on a U-Haul trailer. So, yeah. What is the what is the difference, or how much difference is there between the bolt and the leaf in terms of advantages or disadvantages besides maybe price? It, it's basically the ability to have the extended range. I mean, Pat's car has what amounts to a backup gasoline generator built right into the car. So when your battery level goes low, it is less battery, <laughs> but when it goes low, the engine just kicks on, and it's pretty seamless. I mean, Pat could tell you, you hardly yeah, notice. You don't even notice it. Yeah. Um, for me, I wanted one car. I, I didn't want to have a second car. Right. And so the Volt was perfect for me. So most of my driving is electric. When I need the gas, <laughs> it's the same car. So that's, that was the really big advantage for me. So will the Volt run yeah. as long as you have gas and uh, yeah. Right. Yes. Motor. And it's It'll just regular motor. gas. Yep. That, I can that, go. That motor is just a generator to charge the battery. Right. right. But it generates enough electricity that it'll go as long as you put gas in there. It. It'll charge the batteries up and then it shuts off and then we'll put more black No, it pretty much stays on. It just pretty yeah. much stays on. Yeah, it pretty on much stays on once I run out of my battery. It goes to gas and it stays on. Um, and also, when it's really cold, um, the batteries, even though they might be fully charged, it really prefers to use the uh, generator when it's really cold. Yeah. So I, I think probably you found that too. Yeah, it it wants to get up to up to operating temperature. So it, since it has a it has that gasoline engine, it does have oil. It does have everything that you would expect to find. Yeah. Um, it it wants to get all those fluids mm -hmm. loosened up and warmed up. So it'll it'll run for about maybe. 10, 15 minutes, and if you're if you're driving, it'll kick on every once in a while. But for the most part, if you go down, it always keeps a 20% charge in the battery. But at that 20%, it kicks on that motor, and then it's just like using a using a generator to run an electric motor. So, so is it like a little 10 horse Honda generator or something like that? It's bigger than that. It's, it's a 1.4 liter. Yeah, it's a it's a 1.4 liter engine. Yeah. That just is made to, to drive that electric motor. So you get all the benefits of the torque and the speed and performance of the Volt, but you just have much lower much lower gas use. So you can't plug it in a regular refrigerator house or something like that. Well, you could try. <laughs> I mean, you just splice those wires together and see what happens. But you know, I I do it. I don't know what Pat's experience is, but unless I'm taking a trip someplace out of town. I'll go two to three months without putting gas in my car. Yeah. And it, it does want premium gas because the gas sits in there for a while. But I just I just filled up and it, uh, maybe a week ago, haven't used any of the gas and it cost me $19 and change. It's an eight gallon tank. So basically that plugs in and charges your battery when you're doing a round travel. Right. And when you want to go on an extended trip, then you run the gas in your car. Yeah. And you can even, on my car and, and the newer Volts, you can even shut off the battery usage and only run on electricity when you're on the highway and you're taking that longer trip. And then you can turn it back, turn the battery back on and use it when you're in town. So, so yeah, you can, you can do a lot with it. 
And now the newer bolts, I think, are getting upwards of 50 miles or even 60. Is that right, Mike? 50 or 60 miles yep. on the new volt. The 2016, 2017 volts are getting 50, 60 miles on a charge. Your question about plugging your refrigerator into your car. I think Mark's going to get to that. So. <laughs> I'm actually not going to, but I can answer it. Uh, you can get some kind of an inverter that you plug in underneath the hood and you get a thousand watts off of a leaf or a if you have the sun leaf. And uh, it has a total of 24 kilowatt hours of energy in the battery. So for example, if you know an ice storm was coming, mm -hmm. gonna, the power is going to go out, you charge up your leaf so it's all fully charged before the ice storm comes. And then you could plug an inverter under the hood and run your fridge or your freezer so you wouldn't really mm -hmm. to, you know, throw away all your food. There's a question up here in the front. You had mentioned earlier about the battery does lose its power. Capacity, yeah. Capacity after, some, so when you're buying a used one, okay. wouldn't it be just as important to not only know how many miles, but what the capacity of the battery is left? Yes, that's a very good point. And Nissan has a battery test that they can do at the dealership, or there's a little uh, device that plugs into the diagnostic port and you put an app on your smartphone and it will tell you how strong the battery is at that time. So yeah, if you're going to buy a used one, it wouldn't be bad to try to figure out how strong is that battery. Yep. Okay, let's see, I've got a couple other slides here. Here's the used volts. I found 302 within 200 miles. Uh, 2012 was 13,000. That was in Cedar Falls. The 2013 was 12,000. 2014, 12,000 in Chicago. 2013 for 15,000. So um, for equivalent mileage, the volts tend to have higher miles, like this one's got 102,000 on it. <coughs> the highest leaf I found was 35,000 miles, and it was about an $8,000 car. So you pay about $7,000 more for the used car if you buy the, the volt compared to the leaf. So, how do I get a used Volt home? You just drive it. <coughs> it has the extended range generator, so. Getting it home is not a problem. Uh, let's see here. I skipped one of my, uh, my maintenance things. The all electric EVs, like the LEAF, where there's no backup generator, I mean, there's virtually no maintenance. There's no muffler, there's no oil, oil filter, no oil changes. Air filter, no fuel filter, starter, emissions controls, belts. I don't have any belts in my car. No spark plugs, wires, tune-ups, pistons, rings, fuel injectors. There's not even a transmission in my car. When, if I'm going 25 miles an hour, the electric motor just runs at whatever speed it needs to run to go 25 miles an hour. If I speed up to 55, it just turns faster. And if I want to go 80, it just turns faster. There's no shifting. There's no second gear, third gear, fourth gear, fifth gear, sixth gear. It's just a single speed vehicle. And it's because electric motors can rev up really high speeds. Yeah? How do they cool? I'm sorry? How do they keep it cool? Um, it has a really tiny radiator on it, but it's not really for the motor. It's for <coughs> the batteries and the electronics. It, it's not like an internal combustion engine. You're not burning fuel. Huh? It still generates heat. It does, but I can tell you, having worked at General Motors 17 years and been in factories all that time, we had electric motors that just ran 24 by 7, 365 days a year. We didn't have any cooling on them or anything like that. They just ran forever. Yeah. Actually, that's the one disadvantage of my Volt is that the heater is not that really good. <laughs> so, you know, I wear warm socks and boots in the wintertime. But, uh, yeah, it does have heated seats, but I need a heated floor. It's my favorite. <laughs> and then Chevy Volt, since it has the backup engine, does have an engine, does have fuel filters, has all that stuff. But on average, you only get about 25% of a normal car's maintenance because it's mostly running on electricity almost all the time. So if you bought a car with 100,000 miles on it, the engine would have likely only been run the equivalent of 25,000 miles. So you're getting a car with very low wear on the engine. And I assume the oil changes are also less because you're having much less wear and tear on that engine. They do actually charge less? How do you mean? If you take it to the dealer, 
do they charge us for maintenance yeah. on an electric car like the Leaf? Uh, I never take it to the dealer. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've owned it two and a half years. I've never been to the dealer. Never been to any service station of any kind. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's electric. So yes, they charge less because I simply don't go there. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the fact that you have to have some maintenance for the Chevy Volt, are there mechanics out there or do you have to go back to the dealership to get service? Well, I don't know. Pat, have you done anything outside of the dealership? Uh, all, the only problem I've had, and I probably should ask them about an oil change because they, well, there is a little thing on my car that says, I don't know, 40,000 miles, I need to, yeah, anyway, I haven't worried about an oil change because it hasn't told me that I need one yet, um, but I did have a problem with a tire. Um, the, uh, I only have sight in one eye, and so my depth perception's not always really good. And I've hit a few curbs that I think I probably shouldn't have <laughs> because it had one of those little bubble things on the tire. It's like a cancer on my yeah. tire. That's all I've ever gone in for was tire work. Huh. No check yeah. engine light. No check engine. <laughs> <laughs> a lot less wear when you buy a bolt compared to a gasoline car. Um, the other thing I'll add is by having fewer trips or no trips to the dealer, how many times have you heard the story where the mechanic is changing the oil and he says, Oh, I noticed a problem while doing your oil change. Uh, you could let it go and be stranded, or you could fix it today. Now, it's not broken today, but I can fix it for you. It's $400, you know. Oh, yeah. So, how often does that happen? I don't know. I had my mom quite a bit. Uh, she lived in a retirement village. She'd take her car in, and she would call me later and go, They told me that I had to get such and such repair. And I said, Well, is your car been run? Okay, yeah. Okay, did you have it fixed? Yeah. How much was it? Well, it was like $400. Like, okay. <laughs> it was a little hard to know how many of those things happen. I just never go there, so that never happens to me. Uh, the leaf battery, you do eventually, you will eventually want to replace it as the range drops and drops over time. It has an eight year, 100,000 mile warranty, and it costs $5,500 to replace the battery. So it's got a pretty good warranty on it. Yeah? The Eight years, is that prorated then? Um, I don't think the, the replacement is the replacement. It's 5,500 bucks. So if you decide yeah. to get it replaced, they'll, they'll replace it, no charge. But if you I don't have, know if it's prorated or not. I don't you know have the issue. issue before 100,000 miles and they warranty you. <coughs> yeah. Or they say, well, you like tires. Well shot anyway, so we only give you. Yeah, like tires. I don't, I don't yeah. know the answer to that. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, there's the chargers, there's the used vehicles. Here are the new vehicles you can buy in 2016. Uh, the LEAF range has improved. Uh, the price has not gone up as battery prices have come down. They've dropped about 60% since LEAFs were introduced. The new 2016 is 107 mile range. The old top range used to be 84, now it's 107. Same price. Plus, there's a $7,500 federal tax rebate. The Chevy Volt has been improved as well. They've gone from a, about a 38 to 40 mile range to a 53 EPA rated range on their battery. And the mileage is up. It now gets 43 mile per gallon on regular gas. And uh, it's uh, about the same price, $34,455 for LT turnover, 35000 for the LEAF. They both get the full rebate, $7,500 rebate. But honestly, for your budget, <laughs> a used electric car is a much better deal. They have low, low wear and tear, low maintenance. It's a much better deal than buying new. If I, I bought mine new, if I could go back in time two and a half years and there were used leafs at the time, I would have bought a used leaf. But there weren't at the time, so. Okay, so this is our last slide. What's it like to drive an EV? And you've been asking those questions, so keep going. Anybody got another question? <laughs> Yeah. I, have a, I have a comment about our Prius. We have the 2005, which is traded in on the camera hybrid. One of the things that people, when I would offer them a test drive on ours, they would comment accelerating up a ramp onto the highway that it didn't feel like their other car. They didn't think it was accelerating very fast mm -hmm. because it has a continuously variable transmission. So you don't feel it shifting the gears. You right. don't feel that jerking on your back. So you don't really think it's accelerating. 
then when you look at the speedometer and I tell them, slow down, you're doing 85. <laughs> it's a surprise. Yeah, when I've given people test rides, they'll be looking at the speedometer and go, my gosh, you're at 55 already. So it's the same kind of deal. It really accelerates quickly, and you don't have that because mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, it, it doesn't really shift. It's just one speed. I don't know about the veracity of it, but on, on the internet, uh, I saw numerous complaints about the leaf and having to turn off the heater to get range in the winter time. You, you can do that, and it's one of the reasons I make sure that I, in the winter, I charge up when I come down to Iowa City, because the first year I owned it, I didn't try to charge up. And so on the way home, you'd have this sort of scary experience, like you're watching the range drop, and you're thinking, oh man, uh, I don't think we should use the heater, and we didn't like that. So, in the winter, that's one of the reasons we'll charge up. I want to make sure I have plenty of juice so that on the way home I can run the heater as much as I want. So it just requires a little extra planning. Like I say, if we come that far, if, if I drive back and forth to Westdale Mall, which is our most common trip, in the winter it still does it on a round trip, heater or not, doesn't matter. But coming down to Iowa City from Cedar Rapids, then I need to pick up some charge while I'm down here. So we'll have lunch or breakfast someplace where I can charge. I, I like to use the heater. But yeah, you can you have that as an option. You can hit the you can lower the temperature, that lowers the amount of electricity it's pulling, or you can turn it off. It does have heated seats, it has heated steering wheel. So they've tried to put in creature comfort so that if you're trying to get by without using much heat, it can. But still, in the wintertime I always get a little extra charge. This question is really for Pat since she has a bolt, but my question is if you purchased it and you go on a long trip and you want to recharge it, how do you find charging stations, say in Colorado or California, wherever you're visiting? Uh, there's something called Charge Point that I was, I drove, I drove my car to Mark's house <clears throat> and it's sitting in his garage plugged in right now. And then we came together down here. And as we're driving by, the high V or something, his little car goes bing, telling him there's a charge station nearby. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So there's all sorts of wonderful, and they're on the internet, it's, it's easy to find. Yeah, there's another site called Plug Share that's maintained by people who own electric cars. And so a friend of mine lives in Mount Vernon. He's decided to put his charger on that map. And so if someone with an electric vehicle wants to charge up at his house, they'll see it on the map. <coughs> I did want to say to that to that point too that there, there are different levels of charge that you can get so you can run you can charge a volt off a 120 volt or a 220 volt you can get it hardwired into your home and get a faster charge um, and then the different charge stations at different places like in California they have charge stations all over the place uh, in parking garages etc cetera, etc cetera. and you can get for a for a leaf I think 50% charge in 30 minutes at some of these stations on high speed chargers yeah. yeah so so there's but the infrastructure for a cross country trip or something like that just isn't in place yet but to your point I come down to visit my son and take care of the granddaughter for like all day every other Monday and I just we're going to be there all day I just plug into a 120 volt outlet in his garage Right. And it completely recharges the car in the day that I'm here. Right. So. The, the charger is just like the charger for a laptop. I mean, it just plugs into a regular outlet. It's no yeah. big deal. Yeah. So I think, let's see, that was the person that's yeah. next. Uh, my son had at least a, a leaf in California. And when we visited him, he started the car. He said, oh, the GPS just notified me that there are five more charging stations. Mm -hmm. So the GPS gets updated during the night yep. and it notifies you where there are charging stations. Yep, finding stations is not a problem. Yep. And then I think you were next. Yes, I have a question for Pat. Could you tell us a little more about the Cedar Falls Simple Solar Park? Yes, the um, Simple Solar, we have a municipal electric and they responded to our pressure that uh, they were finally willing to put in a solar park for us. And when they first started it, they told us, well, you can buy a share. And so you're not just buying a panel, but a share. And they told us that would be $399 for a share. So I thought, okay, I need about 10 more. So I said, sign me up for 10 shares. They had so many people signing up 
that we filled up all of the 8 point acres that they had and the price of the shares dropped to $270. So I upped it to 12 shares. I was going to go for 15, but they said, no, then you're making money and you can't make money. And so they said 12 would be okay. So I will finally be kind of a, a net zero. I was supposed to be net zero. Could you go to my house? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I was supposed to be net zero. I put a 2KW system on the roof of my garage. And at the time, I should have been near net zero because we're empty nesters and we don't use that much electricity. Um, unfortunately, then I bought my Volt and I needed more, more electricity. And so now I'll have the shares I need to be, to be uh, electricity neutral again. I like to compare it to when I lived in the country and I had a big old propane tank, <coughs> 8,000 gallon, you know, one of those really big ones. And every summer we'd fill it up and I would feel so good because I know I had the heat, the energy I needed for the rest of the, you know, for the next winter, for the next year. With my solar, it's like I just bought all the electricity I'm gonna need for the rest of my life. And so it's just like, yeah, it's, it feels like filling up a propane tank for me. <laughs> Yeah, and the same for me. It, it wasn't hard. I mean, I dealt with an installer. They put it in. I had to file for the various rebates and incentives. But after I filed the paperwork and got the rebates and got the incentives, in the end, my whole system cost me about seven thousand dollars, and uh, it covers the car one hundred percent. All the stuff in the car needs, and about half of the half what the house needs. So I'm thinking about putting in some more panels so I can cover the whole house too. And it was a sunny day today. So if you look up here, you'll see. I made 9.63 kilowatt hours today. Since I put it in, I'm almost up to eight megawatt hours. So not bad. Not bad for sunshine. My son-in-law of California has a small house that he's put panels on the, on the roof. Uh, he's got it set up in such a fashion, I, and I didn't ask for an explanation, but I asked him what his electric bill was, and his monthly bill is around five dollars a month. Hmm. That's that probably is his meter charge. Uh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. They won't let us make more money than the meter charge. Yeah, I pay a minimum of ten. Even if I don't buy one watt of electricity, I pay ten dollars. That's my contribution to maintaining the grid. Now, do you sell your um, power back to the... I don't. I have net metering. And net metering is basically a swapping arrangement. So during the day, if I produce more than I need, basically it goes into the grid, and the work gets consumed is by my neighbors. So they're all got their TVs on or their refrigerators on or whatever, and I'm producing excess, I'm pushing it into the grid, and it's basically going into their houses from my house, and then the utility is selling it to them for a retail price. Then at nighttime, when the sun goes down, if I need electricity, which I do most nights, um, I pull it out of the grid, and so it has a kilowatt hour bank that my meter keeps track of. How much am I putting in, how much am I pulling out, how much am I putting in, and once a month they read it, and they compare the difference. So last year, five of the 12 months, I didn't buy any electricity. I still pay ten dollars a month to maintain the grid, <coughs> but I didn't buy any electricity. And then the other seven months, like when it gets really hot in August, my panels don't keep up. It also depends how much driving I'm doing with the car. So the first day after I put my solar panels in, I still had my old meter, the one with the spinning dial. <laughs> and so I went out and I looked at it and it was spinning. Yes, I'm sticking it to the van. You know. The next day they came and gave me my, my new meter, which has A and B, and it's not nearly as much fun. Yeah. <laughs> the two-way meter. Yeah. Yep. I heard a uh, broadcast on the radio probably two or three weeks ago about the fact that in one state to the west of us, they're doing away with net metering. Yeah, Nevada's like that. They've done it. They've done away with net metering. They're trying to do it here. They are trying to do it here. They are trying to Yep, there was a bill this year in the uh, <coughs> Senate or Iowa or House legislator, I don't know where it was, got stuck in committee, did not make it out of committee, but uh, somebody tried to float a bill to do away with net metering in Iowa. It's, it's, it's not a smart thing to do. And now your utility board has an open docket on, on net metering right now, and they're 
may try to get rid of it. It doesn't it make any sense. I mean, they've, they've done away with it in Florida, too. I mean, Florida, what's the nickname for Florida? The Sunshine, the sunshine State. So where would it make sense for people to put solar on their roofs? In Florida. There's no money in that for the corporations. That's right. That's right. When, you, when your um, municipal or your utility gets a guaranteed profit, I don't know what it is. Let's say it's 10%. 12. 12%. <laughs> so they get a guaranteed 12% profit. If they spend a million dollars, they're going to get a 12% profit on that base of a million. If they spend a hundred million, they're going to get a 12% profit on that base of a hundred million. So the more they spend, the more profit they're guaranteed to make. And that's why Mid American wanted to build a nuclear power plant because it was seven to 15 billion dollars, and they get a guaranteed rate of return of 12. So the more they spend, the more profit they get. Yeah. Well, they're not, if I'm remembering right, Mike, they wanted the people to pay for that. Oh, up front. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. Which, that's it's like an extra good deal. You pay for the nuclear plant up front, <laughs> yeah. and you keep paying more. But if they get more electric vehicles, they'll be able, they'll be able to sell more electricity, and they'll be able to sell it at night when they have extra. And so it's my feeling that we just have to make them aware of what a great market it would be to have these electric vehicles, and then maybe they won't be so worried about residential solar. Yeah. <laughs> we need to make sure we don't let Iowa do away with net metering. Oh, yeah. It's crazy to let the utilities have a monopoly on generating power from the sun. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you can put it up so easily on your own property and make your own energy. Yeah. Yeah. Any idea what the uh, highest gas mileage on a gas vehicle is now? Uh, the latest Prius, I think, is the highest mileage car I'm aware of. And I think it gets in the city 55 maybe than 44 on the highway. <coughs> gets better mileage in town than it does on the highway. What about the hydrogen cell? Uh, so car? Toyota's got the only fuel cell car on the market. Um, if you think there aren't many charging stations for electric oh, cars, I know. think about how many hydrogen refill stations there are. But in apparently United States. in California there, there are stations, but I just wondered what your thoughts are on that. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I tend to think of these situations from the engineering perspective. I'm trained as an engineer. If you had a certain amount of electricity, 100 kilowatt hours or whatever, some given amount of electricity, if you put that electricity to making hydrogen and then compressing it and then putting it into the fuel cell car and then converting it to the fuel cell and driving the wheels, and you took that same electricity and you put it into a battery for an electric car, the electric car would go three times farther on the electricity than the hydrogen car would. My own feeling is that the people who want to push fuel cell technology are closet fossil fuel people. Because <laughs> the cheapest hydrogen is to use what they call steam reforming of natural gas. And by heating up natural gas with steam, they can drive off the hydrogen. And that's how much of the hydrogen today is made, even in some of those recharging stations. So it's just trading. I don't know why you would do that, because you can buy natural gas powered cars where you just compress the natural gas and, and run around with that. Honda's been selling those for years. I don't, I don't know why you would do the hydrogen fuel cell car. So Toyota's, Toyota's made a bad idea. I think so. Uh, it could be proved wrong. Ten years from now, it would be fuel cell cars everywhere, you know. And electric cars would be a thing of the past, but I don't think so. The problem is the infrastructure. Yeah. Whereas electricity? Yeah. Think about Iowa City. How many buildings have electricity going to those buildings today? <laughs> At least two. <laughs> Maybe more. I mean, electricity is everywhere. It's everywhere. So, you know, the one time my battery got kind of low on my leaf, um, we were out in the middle of nowhere, coming back to Cedar Rapids, and we pulled off at a restaurant. They scouted around. They had an electrical outlet on the outside. So I asked the lady at the counter, "Hey, if we have lunch here, do you mind if I plug my car? My car's kind of low on power. I need to recharge my battery." I said, oh, "That's fine." So we plugged in on their outside electrical outlet. It gave me enough power to get home on. And you know, we had lunch there. We stayed there for an hour and 20 minutes or something like that while I picked up that little bit of charge necessary to get home on. 
and they didn't build any new infrastructure for my car, they didn't do anything different. And in two and a half years, I only had to do that once. So, pretty good. Electricity's everywhere. Whereas, I don't know where you go to get hydrogen. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? So my leaf is out in the parking deck. It's like on the second floor. Anybody wants to go out there and look at it or sit in it or see how roomy it is or not? Uh, be glad to have you come out there and take a look at it. Uh, if there's few enough of you that want to do it, I'll give you a little spin around the block or something like that. It's usually popular when I teach classes. I teach a solar class and electric vehicle class at Kirkwood. And so uh, I just taught the solar one just this last weekend out in Coralville. And uh, I offered there and I got three takers. And we tooled around the parking lot and everybody went, whoa! <laughs> so, so you're going to start selling leads pretty soon? They asked me that. They, you know, I'm retired now and uh, I told my wife, you know, maybe I should take a part-time job at a Nissan dealership. I do love my electric cars. They are really good for our society. If you think about what the future will be like, five years, 10 years, 20 years, we're gonna be driving electric cars. That's just the deal. You know, gasoline eventually runs out. You saw that Shell was gonna do Arctic drilling, but it was such a fiasco with the high seas and everything that they gave up on it. It's that expensive to drill in the Arctic. And if they ever have a, a Gulf oil rig disaster like they had in the Gulf in, in the Arctic, it would be terrible. It'd just terrible. So. There's a um, Ford uh, electric hybrid too that a friend of mine had just bought. Um, when I was looking at my Volt, looking to buy my Volt two or three years ago, um, the Ford dealers in the entire state, none of them had sent their mechanics to get the training for the electric hybrid. And so they weren't selling them at all. But in the past two years, they've been doing that. So the Fords are available now, too. Yeah. Was it there a complaint of, a little while ago uh, about, I, I'm not sure if it was the uh, leaf or the bolt, but there were problems with the edges. They would actually catch fire. Is that probably There were some stories about the Tesla. The Tesla had some fires early on. Okay. It mostly came from road damage. And what they did was they beefed up the bottom of the steel plate on the bottom to prevent road damage. And they just had a Tesla fire in Norway. So, but I can tell you, as a percent of the fleet, there are fewer electric car fires than there are gasoline mm -hmm. fires. Yeah. Was there some problem with uh, electric cars that have been in accidents and people being electrocuted with shorts that occurred as a result of it? Um, I haven't heard anything like that. Um, I first started hearing stories around that issue when the Prius came out. Because the Prius had this kind of bodacious, thick electric cable coming from its battery. And they were worried that a fireman came up with a loss of life and they had to, you know, pry apart the steel that that cable would get in the way. Um, electric cars have been designed since those days with cutoffs, so if you get in an accident, it, gets, it cuts those connections. And I haven't heard any firemen or emergency crews being hurt by electric cars. I got a question back here. Is it true that it costs more money to produce a kilowatt of electricity with solar than it does with gasoline because of subsidies that they're giving the solar energy? No, that is not true. So. And the solar subsidy, have you ever heard of the Tom Ashbrook show on NPR? They had a nice podcast on this recently. The solar industry figures in about five years that they will not need subsidies. The, the cost of solar is dropping so much that they'll be able to compete like with any energy still, source. At the present time, it still costs more than natural gas. Um, I don't know. The uh, It might be subsidies that are doing that. you got to remember that we also subsidize the fossil fuel industry hugely. So comparing natural gas and electricity and solar, they're both being subsidized right now. We've been subsidizing the fossil fuel industry for a hundred years. So, you know, it's like in the Gulf where they drill for oil. Those Most of those are federal lands and they passed a law in the 90s, I think. They're selling that oil to the oil companies for like nothing. You know, when they get it out of there, it doesn't, they hardly reimburse, if at all, to the United States for taking oil out of federal lands. 
That seems like a pretty big subsidy. Well, yeah, sure. otherwise the Arabs will buy us out of everything. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> so if you don't like buying fuel from the Arabs, you got an alternative. What can I do? <laughs> Solar panel, electric car. I can't buy my pickup on the gas when it's electric car. You will be able to. You will be able to. Other questions? There's some hands up, yeah. So you said your uh, leaf seated five comfortably. So thinking of all these Christmas shoppers around here and stuff, does the fuel mileage go down in it when it's fully loaded versus one person in it? Or I'm sure it does. Um, I haven't really tried to measure that. I mean, any vehicle, when you put five adults in it, it's going to weigh more. It's going to be a little harder to accelerate. But I got to tell you, in this parking lot, I had four adults in that test drive. And they were all going, oh my gosh, oh wow, you know, as it accelerated through the parking lot. So even with four adults, it still accelerates very briskly. Um, but yeah, I assume that it, it does lose some efficiency from carrying more weight. It, it's a physics kind of thing. Yeah. Although I gotta tell you, the torque is so, there's so much torque on the electric motor, you don't feel the difference. It might be sucking more power of the battery, but it's not like, oh boy, you know, I don't, don't dare carry four adults in this car because it just won't accelerate. It's not like that. It has tons of acceleration. Other questions? So it yeah. still has regenerative braking and that sort of thing, doesn't it? It does, and, and that's one of the low cost maintenance aspects of an electric vehicle, even for the Volt. When you start to slow down, the electric motor turns into a generator, and all that forward motion and inertia gets converted back into electricity and goes right back into the battery. So you're using the brakes a lot less. I mean, my car has brakes, just like any car would have. And they'll stop the car without the motor slowing it down. But I hardly ever use those brakes. When I take my foot off, I can adjust the levels to two levels, either a really aggressive level of getting that electricity back or a not as aggressive level. And um, it works quite well. You can, there's a little meter on the dash that shows the power going back on battery. Other questions?